When you hear the word cancer, you typically think death sentence. Does it have to be? Who here has been touched by cancer? Family member, friend, sports figure, anyone. Like you, I've been touched by cancer. I lost my mother when I was nine years old, and 10 years later, I lost my father, both of them to cancer. In those days, there wasn't any grief counseling, and I wouldn't want another child, or an adult for that matter, to have to endure that kind of pain. Losing both parents in such a short period of time was devastating to me and to my two sisters. Based on this, I ask you, who wouldn't jump at the chance of making a loved one's cancer a livable chronic disease with a high quality of life instead of a death sentence. As part of my scientific journey, I studied insulin physiology at the University of Toronto, working in the Banting and Best Department of Medical Research. This is where insulin was discovered in the summer of 1921. And the, the department was named in honor of the co-discoverers after Dr. Banting won the Nobel Prize in 1923. Before the discovery of insulin, a diagnosis of diabetes was a death sentence. Banting and Best made diabetes a livable chronic disease with a high quality of life. I'm working towards making cancer a livable chronic disease with a high quality of life. Following postdoctoral studies and a faculty appointment, I was recruited to the Medical University of South Carolina. It's here I focus research on insulin-like growth factor, which I'll refer to as growth factor for simplicity's sake. Now, the growth factor differs from insulin in that it has no effect on glucose. Instead, it's responsible for normal growth during development all the way up through maturity. Then in the adult, it goes from hero to villain and becomes the enemy. And that's because now it can stimulate the growth of cancer cells, stimulated by the growth factor. Importantly, we had shown that a growth inhibitor protein could block cancer growth by the growth factor, including breast, prostate, pancreatic, and other cancers. So based on this, we started analyzing how the growth inhibitor interacts with and blocks the growth factor. For these studies, we needed to make large quantities of the inhibitor protein shown here. To accomplish this, we got all the necessary items from a fellow scientist working in Switzerland. And we were off. Work progressed nicely to the point where we decided to do a deeper dive and study pieces of the inhibitor. The idea here was to determine whether a majority of the inhibitory activity could be associated with one of these pieces. And if so, we would take that piece and use it as a starting point to make a more effective inhibitor. Well, these studies went as predicted. Each piece had a different amount of activity that is, until we got to the, blue, the piece shown in blue here. And then we hit the proverbial wall. We couldn't coax any activity from this piece, no matter what we did. Eventually, my student came to me and she said, you know, there's something really funny about this test tube. Funny? Funny like in the best thing since sliced bread? Or funny like, there ain't nothing happened in here. Well, we eventually looked at some of that sample in the microscope, and surprisingly, we saw glowing fibers. Further analysis revealed that these fibers were hollow and that they were, in fact, nanotubes. <sighs> nanotubes? Well, this was both unexpected and surprising, 
and had important ramifications. That's because there's been considerable interest in nanotubes and nanoparticles across scientific disciplines. For example, in medicine, nanotubes are being evaluated for safe drug delivery. And you're all familiar with, whether you realize it or not, with nanoparticle drug dis delivery. And that's because the COVID vaccines made by Moderna and Pfizer are packaged in nanoparticles. More about drug delivery in a moment, but first, what are nanotubes? Nanotubes are incredibly tiny particles in the shape of a tube or a straw, and as their name implies, they're measured in the nanometer range. So how small is a nanometer? Well, if you look in your program, at the end of each sentence is a period. Each one of those periods is one million nanometers wide. And we can place about one million of our nanotubes spread evenly across the surface of each of those periods. The next question that begs to be answered is, how do the blue pieces generate nanotubes? Here's the thing. Our inhibitor had a mistake in it, indicated by the red ball. And you can also see that that red ball exists and is located in that blue piece. When it's in the full-length inhibitor shown on the left, it has no impact on the biological activity of that inhibitor. It still binds to the growth factor and blocks it. But when all you have is large quantities of that blue piece in a test tube, that's another story. That mistake enables those blue pieces to snap together like magnetic building blocks, and they spontaneously assemble into nanoparticles. This is a highly ordered process. The nanotubes are always 35 nanometers wide, and they can be anywhere from 10 nanometers to 10,000 nanometers long. And that explains the fibers we saw on the microscope and the fact that we didn't see any biological activity. And now back to drug delivery. So here's what we'll do. We take the nanotubes and we load them with toxic anti-cancer drugs indicated by the red dots. Now this protects normal healthy tissues when we inject the nanotubes. We'll then place smart molecules on the surface of the nanotubes indicated by the blue arrows that are pointing downward. These smart molecules will drive the nanotubes to cancer cells which express large quantities of the target to that smart molecule indicated by the bullseyes. So the nanotubes will stick to the bullseyes. They'll be taken into the cell where they'll be broken down and released to the cancer drugs, killing the cancer cells without an effect on normal healthy tissues. Wow. This is analogous to a heat-seeking missile, which, like the nanotubes, locks onto its target and destroys it. Current nanotubes are typically made from carbon or gold, and these are toxic chemicals in and of themselves, and their nanotubes tend to get trapped in tissues where they accumulate and cause additional toxicities. Our nanotubes have a distinct advantage in that they're natural products and are non-toxic. Wow. Our nanotubes were an accidental discovery, which is referred to as serendipity, which is a term that was coined in the mid-1700s by Sir Horace Walpole. In 1980, John Lennon wrote in the lyrics to Beautiful Boy, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. What he was reminding us is that life happens and that it's unpredictable. Sometimes, so is science. So in closing, I want to encourage everyone to embrace the unexpected and to persevere. If something doesn't look right at first, try a different perspective. In our case, a fortunate mistake resulted in the identification of a new source of nanotubes and a future novel precision drug delivery system. This serendipitous discovery 
takes us one step closer to completing my mission of making cancer a livable chronic disease with a high quality of life and not a death sentence.